There are fears of an escalation in the Middle East conflict after explosions were heard in Iran. Two U.S. officials have confirmed to our broadcast partner CBS News that it was an attack from Israel. State television in Iran has reported big explosions near an army base and airport in the central city of Isfahan, activating local air defense systems. Blasts have also been reported in the country's northwest. Video online shows Iranian defense missiles being fired into the air. Commercial flights were, div were diverted around Iranian airspace, but Iranian media say all restrictions have now been lifted. The International Atomic Energy Agency has confirmed that there is no damage to Iran's nuclear facilities. Rafael Mariano Grossi, director general of the agency, said on social media he continues to call for extreme restraint from everybody and reiterates that nuclear facilities should never be a target in military conflicts. Iran's semi-official Tasnim news agency, which is close to the Islamic Revolution Guard Corps, posted a video with a caption saying, if Isfahan's nuclear site is completely safe, a man near the Isfahan Nuclear Technology Center is seen in a video that we will show you very shortly. And in this Hello, video that's come in from the semi-official Tasnim news agency, you can see there a man holding a watch to the camera, which indicates the time and date. We can then see several troops standing around what looks like an air defense battery. Explosions have also been reported in southern Syria, apparently from missiles targeting radar sites. Explosions to in Iraq in the capital Baghdad and Babil province to the south. Israel has promised to respond to Iran's drone and missile attack on Saturday night. Both NBC and CNN have reported unnamed officials saying that Israel warned Washington, but that Washington did not endorse the action. The U.S. has restricted travel for its embassy staff in Israel out of an abundance of caution. The U.S. embassy issued this statement. The security environment remains complex and can change quickly depending on the political situation and recent events. Well, for more on this, I'm now joined by Majid Afshar, senior reporter with BBC Persian. Thank you for joining us. Just bring us up to date on the information we're getting from Iran, but also other countries who are watching developments on the ground. Um, what we're getting from Iranian media is quite limited because at the moment there, there, there seems to be an effort from by the Iranian media to downplay the incident. We were, as you said, we had reports of explosions loud explosions in the city of Isfahan. We now know that the, the, the explosions were heard from a, an area called Qahjavaristan, which is east of the city of Isfahan, where one of the main air bases, uh, missile defense systems of Iran is located very close to the international airport in Isfahan. Um, and there were also reports of explosions in the city of Tabriz, in the northwest of the country, where another uh, air defense system is based. And now, at the moment, we are hearing from the governor of uh, Azerbaijan, uh, East Azerbaijan province, that uh, they, 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 there were a number of drones there and they tried to down them there. So um, we are now getting confirmation that explosions were heard also near another airbase in the city of um, Tabriz. Um, as, as you said, the, the nuclear facilities seem to be safe, um, but, but the, 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 the situation is quite changing every, every minute as we are getting reports. There are um, video footage, there's footage on social media showing um, fire inside a, an, an, a, an air base in, in Isfahan, but we cannot confirm it at the moment. My colleagues at BBC Persian are trying to, to, to validate that, to see if this is today or not. But all we're getting is the air defense system was activated in the city of Isfahan and now Salon, in the city of Tabriz to down a number of Salon. drones. Just tell us about the reaction from Iranian officials, because so far, 
the assessment is that they're trying to downplay what has happened. We've heard from uh, some officials saying that no damage has been done and it was just a few drones that were in the skies over Isfahan. Exactly. Um, the, the question is, uh, Iranian side, when they attacked Israel uh, on, on Saturday night and over the weekend, they, they, have, they had tried to say this was a successful attack and that's what you see in the Iranian media landscape. They, that's what they did. If they manage to downplay what happened today, then there, there seems to be, this seems to be an effort to somehow convince their hardline supporters inside the country that um, nothing has happened, there's no need for a response, because the Iranian side has always been saying that if there is an air strike, they, they will res reply to that, there, there will be a counterattack. Now, the main question here is, uh, what, is this an attack from outside the country or are, are these drones just uh, f took off from inside the country? The Iranian side is definitely trying to restore deterrence as the Israelis are trying to do. And if they manage to downplay this incident, maybe they can restore that. Maybe they can achieve the goal of restoring uh, deterrence inside the country. What do you think Iran would want to achieve? Because obviously there calls for an end to the tit for tat strikes that we've seen um, over the past few weeks. What would be, let's call it a win, a way to get out of this situation for Iran? It's already, um, at least from what we see from the Iranian official statements, a win for Iran, even if they don't re reply to this. Jerusalem Post minutes ago published a, a, a report citing an Israeli official that there was an airstrike and this was a message to the Iranian side that if they want they can they can strike inside Iran. Iranian officials, if they manage to, to say that there was no damage, nothing has happened, no harm has been done, maybe they can they can see this as, as a win at the same time, getting the message and, and stop this tit for tat um, attacks, as you said. Uh, the Iranian side obviously does not want to, 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 to escalate this because they know that if, if it comes to a military, direct military conflict, they're not in, in any way um, comparable to what uh, Israel, Israelis are capable of doing. The Iranian air defense system is also quite weak. And, um, and, and also, um, we know that Israeli air, air, air um, like fighter jets and stuff, they can do damage to the Iranian side. And there is precedence of um, like Israeli um, clandestine operations inside Iran. Thank you very much, Majid, for that update and analysis. That's Majid Afsha from the BBC Persian Service. Well, joining me now on the line is Adnan Tabatai, Iran analyst and CEO of Capro. Carpo, a think tank focusing on Iran and the Middle East in Germany. Thank you for joining us on the program. First of all, what's your assessment of the reports that we've been getting over the past few hours? In my in my view, what we are currently seeing is, as your colleague has um, very well elaborated on, um, that the Iranian side is trying to portray this as something really um, minimal as something that basically lays to rest the whole the, the whole tit for tat situation and that this was basically nothing um, and we will obviously have to wait uh, for more accurate information to come out about what exactly happened but at this stage I think it's important to just acknowledge the fact that um, there seems to be no will to escalate this further there appears to be no will to escalate this further there would be also considerations within um, Iran, hardliners within the government there who'd want perhaps tougher action against Israel. Do you think if Iran was to not carry out another strike and was to say, well, this strike wasn't that bad, that would be enough to please the hardliners? I believe so. I think that the the overall appetite to, to launch another attack um, in spite of what was said publicly, I think the appetite has not been um, that big. Um, so it's actually, I believe right now also to the benefit of officials in Iran to be able to downplay what happened or to really just say that what happened is not significant enough for us to, to retaliate at this stage. What's your assessment of how we got here? Because 
Both sides have been clear that they do not want a wider war in the region. They do not want to escalate tensions. But we found ourselves in these positions where we've seen these, you know, large strikes or strikes um, over the past few weeks. Yeah, indeed. I think the 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 dangerous situation here is the constant pushing of of red lines. Um, they, Iran has always acted in a way that was plausibly deniable. It went through its aligned groups in the region, um, but that red line was obviously crossed on, on Sunday. Um, the Israelis, by attacking an Iranian consular building in Damascus and killing IRGC um, commanders, was another form of crossing red lines. So that, that is the dangerous situation we're seeing. But when these red lines are pushed, we may also be able to move within a range of, um, of actions, which means that there will no, no further escalation be on the horizon. One word that has been spoken often has been deterrence. So both countries wanting to deter the other from attacking them, the one to feel secure in what perhaps can be, you know, quite a dangerous neighborhood. How would international partners go about making Israel and Iran feel secure that they won't be attacked? Um, you're pointing to a very, very relevant issue here, and that is um, the 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 face-saving deterrence game that is necessary on, on both sides. And I really believe third parties have a role to play here. And what I miss, particularly from European countries, is to really effectively call for restraint and try to give both sides a sense of you have it's restored your deterrence. Um, we can see that you can do each other serious harm. Um, and now, please, for the sake of, of peace and no further escalation, call for restraint on both sides. We, I haven't seen that in a way that, that I would have hoped from particularly European countries. And let's see whether today's event or last night's event uh, changed that. Thank you very much. That's Adnan Tabatai, CEO of Carpo. We can now speak to our Middle East correspondent, Yoland Nell. And Yoland, we're getting reaction, international reaction to this attack, these explosions in Iran. Countries still trying to figure out what happened. What are we hearing from Israeli officials? So the Israeli military has not had any comment on whether this was uh, an Israeli offensive inside Iran. Um, but the Israeli media is clearly presenting it as such. And you've also got the U.S. media quoting unnamed Israeli and U.S. officials saying that this was um, an Israeli strike on Iran that took place. Now, the information that's kind of coming out is mainly from Iran, where, of course, there is not a, a free press. You have had um, overnight uh, these reports, first from the, the semi-official fast news agency, where it talked about three explosions being heard in Isfahan, right in the center of the country, um, close to a key airport, close to an important uh, military base. Um, then the, the state TV was saying in Iran that um, these were uh, ground explosions that took place. There had been air defense systems that had been activated um, in response to drones, which you can apparently see in some footage uh, that is circulating on social media. And uh, really trying very much on the Iranian side to downplay what happened here. We're not hearing anything about uh, significant damage at all. Um, that said, in Israel uh, this morning, I mean, of course, this has been a very tense week as everyone waited to see um, how the country would respond. Um, it was really made clear that the country felt it had to respond to that unprecedented attack by Iran last weekend with more than 300 attack drones and missiles being launched at the country. Um, this is a country that's about to have uh, the, the Jewish Passover holiday. Many schools have broken up. People uh, have been preparing to travel. There's been this kind of continuing state of uncertainty. And it's telling this morning uh, that the Israeli military has not uh, updated its advice. It said there's no change in instructions to the Israeli public um, about the state of alert that the country is now on, uh, suggesting it is not bracing itself uh, for retaliation from Iran. The Reuters news agency, interestingly quoting an unnamed uh, senior Iranian official who they say says that no retaliation is planned um, and is presenting this as more of a case of infiltration rather than an attack on Iran. And Yolande, we're just seeing reports um, from the from Iranian media. This is on the BBC Live page. And an Iranian official 
is quoted as saying Iran has no plan for immediate action. So this was a comment to the Reuters news agency. So falling in line with comments that we've been seeing that Iran also has no appetite to escalate the tensions there in the Middle East. Um, just talk us through what's likely to happen over the next few days. Obviously, at the moment, the focus is on what's happening between Iran and um, Israel, but also eyes are focused on what's happening in Gaza. Indeed, and I think there's uh, so much happening uh, diplomatically behind the scenes at the moment to try to calm things down. We have seen this morning also these uh, reports um, of uh, an attack by Israel in Syria, according to the UK-based uh, Syrian Observatory for Human Rights uh, on, on a Syrian army base. We've also had rocket sirens um, going off warning of a potential incoming fire in the north of Israel, where there has been this increase in recent days in uh, cross-border fire uh, between Israeli forces and Hezbollah, the powerful uh, Iran-backed Lebanese group. Um, so really, uh, a lot of fears that um, Iran's proxies could also uh, get involved in retaliation and attacks, even if we don't have that coming from Iran directly. Thank you very much. Uh, that's the BBC's Yolande Nell there with analysis and reaction from Jerusalem. Well, G7 foreign ministers are meeting in Italy. These are live pictures from that meeting in Capri. They've been reacting to the news. We can actually go live now to our correspondent, Jess Parker, who's in Capri for us. So we've been getting reaction from ministers there. Just talk us through what they've been saying. Yeah, good morning to you in the last hour or so. Hearing from some of those uh, foreign ministers who, as you say, are here in Capri for the G7 foreign ministers meeting. They had discussed the situation in the Middle East yesterday and then moved on to other issues, including the war in Ukraine. But it now seems as though the Middle East very much back on the agenda. Just to bring you some of that reaction, first of all, Italy's foreign minister, Antonio Tajani, who's chairing proceedings here, he has said on the social media platform X, I have just spoken with our ambassador to Iran. I'm following developments following the nighttime explosions in Isfahan. We will talk about it with the foreign ministers at the G7 session in Capri uh, this morning. He goes on to say there are no critical issues uh, for Italians living in Iran. And then Canada's foreign minister, Melanie Jolie, says she's been briefed by Global Affairs Canada officials about the overnight explosions, again monitoring the situation closely and reiterating uh, that the situation will be addressed uh, at the session of the G7 foreign ministers uh, this morning. So that's the reaction that we have so far. We are expecting to hear from other foreign ministers uh, later on today as this G7 uh, foreign ministers meeting is due to wrap up. So we should expect reactions here on the Italian island of Capri throughout the day. And over the past uh, couple of days, Jess, we've seen some countries there meeting in uh, Capri, putting sanctions, further sanctions on Iran following its uh, strike on Israel. Do we expect any other announcements um, during this meeting? I haven't had any indications that we'll get further announcements of that kind. So what happened uh, following Saturday's uh, attack by Iran, which of course was in itself uh, a response to a strike on an Iranian embassy in a, or consulate in Syria. Um, following that, there were some very uh, advanced broadcast messages that there would be further sanctions. And yesterday we heard from the US and the UK who said they'd come up with a coordinated package to sanction individuals and industry bodies linked to Iran's uh, missile and drone program. The European Union as well, during a summit in Brussels, said they would be looking uh, at further restrictive measures going forward against Iran as well. This just adds to sanctions that are already applied to Tehran. So the UK, for example, said that it had sanctioned 13 individuals and entities, adding to 400 existing sanctions already in place. But I think they were trying to do a couple of things, send a message to Iran in response to what had happened on Saturday. Also, as part of this effort to try and de-escalate uh, tensions in the region, we've heard this message uh, from Western leaders to Israel, to 
try and show restraint or even not retaliate at all. And I think it was part of that effort to sell uh, to Israel this message of take the win, as President Biden uh, put it, uh, following the events of the last week. Of course, we're still getting a very emerging picture this morning in terms of what is actually uh, happened in Iran, but uh, it will very much be up for discussion here uh, at the closing session of G7 foreign ministers today. And Jess, briefly, just talk us through some of the other issues that have been discussed there in Capri. Yeah, I mean, the other main item on the agenda has been the uh, war in Ukraine. So Dmitry Kuleba, Ukraine's foreign minister, uh, has been here on the island of Capri, again, asking for further assistance, particularly air defence systems, missiles and Jens Stoltenberg, the Secretary General of the NATO Military Alliance, is here as well. Um, we were at a press conference with him yesterday and he was saying there is an urgent critical need for more air defence uh, systems uh, to go to Ukraine as soon as possible. Really at the moment it's not quite clear where those air defence systems might come from. Germany recently uh, pledged an additional battery uh, to Ukraine. Jens Stoltenberg said conversations were ongoing, but with partner countries about whether there could be a further assistance. Uh, there is some hope uh, because the US aid package that has been so long stalled in Congress worth $60 billion uh, for Ukraine. Uh, Congress is moving towards a vote on that. So that caused a little bit of optimism here. But actually, overall, officials that I've been speaking to say the mood on this issue has been quite downbeat.